All right, hello everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I hope you're excited as we are in your faculty are to uh, do our first ever Oslo Norway program. Uh, we have your faculty. You want to say hello? Hi, I'm Dr. Katie Bizantz in Art History. My name is David Overly. I'll be teaching the Peace Studies class there. Very excited about that. <laughs> and we have Paula from AIFS. Hi, everybody. Good morning. And I'm John Moore, so I've been spamming you probably <laughs> about Oslo. Um, so um, Paula will run us through the program, yeah. and then we'll hear from your faculty. Fantastic. So we're very excited. Congratulations on your decision to study abroad. It's definitely a life-changing experience, one that you'll never regret. We always say that you'll always regret not taking the decision to study abroad, but actually no one ever has come back from study abroad and said, geez, I wish I hadn't done that. No, they come back and say, that was the best thing I've ever done. That was the greatest thing. When can I go again? So we definitely want you guys to um, experience Oslo with your faculty and why study abroad right that's the my first question to you why bother we got everything we need right here in southern california we have mountains we have beach we have chick-fil-a and starbucks what else do we need right let's think about study abroad as an investment in your education and investment in your future currently less than 10 percent of u.s college students study abroad across the country we have something like 40 million college students and only about three hundred and seventy five thousand study abroad every year. So study abroad is something that you're doing right now to set you apart, right? When you go to transfer, when you are done with your degree and you enter the competitive job market, you're going to have something on your resume, right? It's going to be featured prominently on your resume, something on your resume that 90% of the people that you're competing with for that position will not have. It definitely sets you apart. It shows college administration uh, admissions and employers that you have attained certain skills. Things like intercultural competence, right? What is intercultural competence? It is the ability to talk to, empathize, relate to people from other cultures. I can't think of any field currently that is not, in not some way touched by people from other cultures, other companies, other countries, sorry. Um, I mean, it's an ever-shrinking world, right, with technology, with uh, communication. The world is closer and smaller than ever. So it, whether be it you're going into education, criminal justice, you're going into business, certainly, uh, politics. You need to be able to relate to people from other cultures, right? Healthcare, especially. So having study abroad on your resume means that you're not just saying that you have this skill, but you actually can prove that you've attained this skill. Diversity problem solving. LinkedIn did a survey of employers across the country. Intercultural competence and problem solving were the top five skills that they're looking for. So again, you'll be able to demonstrate there were moments in Oslo when you were studying abroad that you had this issue and you figured it out, right? You'll be able to talk about that in a job interview. Thinking out of the box to right being creative those are skills that you will develop when you're there you'll have to adapt right they're not going to change Norway to do it the way we do it here in SoCal you'll have to adapt to the way that they do it there flexibility too you'll learn to be flexible go with the flow that's something that travel certainly teaches you so these are reasons why you study abroad right to develop all these skills to make you a better person to make you a better employee um, 85% of the students that we talk to tell us that that study abroad experience was the best thing that they ever did, right? Eight and a half out of ten people. Like I said, no one ever comes back and says it was it was terrible. It was the worst thing I ever did, for sure. Um, and then just some more statistics to give you. We've done surveys of students five, ten, twenty years out back from their study abroad experience. And we asked them to tell us what kind of things study abroad brought to their lives, right? 100% of them told us that they improved their GPA when they came back, right? They were outside of their comfort zone, outside of their normal everyday life. They figured out what they like to do, what they're good at, what makes them happy, and how to 
you know, get and reach the end goal. So a hundred them, a hundred percent of them realize that that academic path and then um, improve their GPA. You're twice as likely to find employment. That's what study abroad statistics say. So 97% of study abroad students find a job within 12 months versus only 47%. So again, having that Cult, that international uh, experience on your resume, you're twice as likely to hear you're hired. And then 25% higher salary, it makes you more um, prepared for higher paying jobs. So we like to say eventually study abroad pays for itself. And on average, it usually pays for itself within a first year of working. So that's really good. And then the last one is that 90% of study abroad students um, get into their first or second choice of grad schools. We don't have that information for transfer, but I know that my son, who was a Citrus College student who did study abroad, just transferred to Cal State, and he listed his honors classes, and then he had to list which classes that he did as a study abroad student. So they're weighing honors classes. They're also weighing study abroad classes, so it helps you transfer as well. All right, and then just to give you a little idea of who we are, we're AI Fest Study Abroad. So we uh, work with colleges and universities across the country. We do all the setup and the running of the program. So right now we're working with John and with your faculty to make the program meet their academic objectives. We also have health and safety as our number one priority. So we'll have a local program coordinator who will meet you all at the airport when you get there on the group flight, who will make sure that the program runs as smoothly as possible. And if something happens, because real life happens, maybe you're not feeling well, you need to see a doctor. Um, maybe, you know, a train is not working or a bus didn't come to pick us up that we expected. You'll have people there to make sure that the whole thing goes as smoothly as possible. Um, we've been doing study abroad a long time, for over 50 years, and we've sent a million and a half students abroad. I, I myself was one of them. When I was a junior in college, I did study abroad with AIFS. My college in New York was affiliated with AIFS, and I did it, and I went to Spain for a year. Completely changed my life, right? I went to a college really nearby, um, would come home every weekend, even though I lived on campus. Waste of money. And, uh, but when I was ready to go to Spain, I went and I was gone for a year. And then I ended up moving back there and lived there for 25 years. So it completely changed the whole, my whole plan, but it was a good thing. And we've been working with Citrus College for a long time, for 30 years now. We've been sending Citrus College students abroad to London, Spain, uh, Japan, right? We've sent students last summer to Japan. So this will be our first time in Norway with you all. And we're super excited to explore this new destination. I'm gonna introduce your faculty now. Professor Overly will tell you a little bit about why Oslo. And I love this photo, which is a photo actually of one yeah, of your friends. Yeah, one of my friends was in Oslo, and so she generously let us have her Instagram photos for our presentation. It makes me a little nervous even looking at it, but it's and the that is photo ever. ever doing that. So. I am very excited about teaching uh, peace studies in Oslo. Um, because Oslo is the home of the Nobel Peace Prize. And Alfred Nobel, when he was late in life, there was an obituary that was a mistake that referred to him as a merchant of death because his claim to fame is he invented dynamite. Well, he didn't like that, so he became uh, very involved with Greta von, um, lost her, I was going to say Sustran, but I lost her name. Anyway, she was one of the early Nobel laureates, and, and she really pushed him in the direction of Oslo being a good place to give his award, so to create his posthumous fame. And I can tell you about it. I placed a bunch of talking points on that handout I gave you. Norway is noted for its clean and harmonious existence. Uh, if you keep track of... Uh, UN World Happiness Reports, Norway is ranked number two on the World Happiness Report. The United States is only ranked 18th. Uh, Norway is very safe. It has very low crime incarceration rates. Uh, th there's a freedom of roam law that allows people to walk around on unguarded territory. So if you go out into the woods or something or you go across a field, nobody's going to come up to you and say, excuse me, you're trespassing. No, you have an open access in Norway. Uh, 
Also, most Norwegians speak English. With only four and a half million Norwegians, they don't expect visitors to speak Norwegian. And so they learn English. And also, young people are very interested in English because if they want to watch American or British popular culture, they have to speak English. And so they do play, you know, English language uh, television in Norway, in addition to Norwegian language television. Um, it's very compact and easy to explore on foot. It's very pedestrian friendly. They have a very good public transit system, metros, trams, buses, trains, and ferries. And so when you study abroad, especially in these short three or four weeks, type courses, we spend a lot of time out in the streets. It's very experiential. It's not like you're going to be spending, you know, eight hours a day in a classroom and, by the way, you just happen to be in Oslo. No, we'll spend a little bit of time in the classroom, but we'll spend a lot of time visiting places. So it'll be very good for us to, to travel about. There's something called the Oslo Pass, which gives you, you know, unlimited access to public transportation there and unlimited access to museums. Uh, one can easily rent bicycles there. Also, there's a lot of outdoor activities. Oslo is surrounded by hills and forests where people hike and walk. I mean, it's at the same latitude as Anchorage, Alaska, but they don't actually get a lot of snow in Oslo itself. They get a lot of snow in the hills all around Oslo. There's the Holman Colon ski jump, which you can't miss seeing. That was the site of the 1952 Winter Olympics. So it's, it's very, uh, very much a, a Nordic country, and if you sign up for the trip to Bergen, which is a three-day trip uh, from Oslo over to the West Coast, we'll actually go up into the hills, and even in the summertime, you will be seeing snow on the ground. And who knows, maybe if we're lucky, you'll have a blustery snow falling. You never know when you go up into the mountains. In addition, Norway is the home of the Midnight Sun. Uh, if you went there in the middle of winter, it gets dark fairly early by, you know, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And even at 11 o'clock in the morning, it looks late in the day here. But we're going to have a lot of sun. Sun's not going to go down. So you're going to have a lot of chance to go outside. Uh, Oslo is at the end of about a 120-kilometer uh, fjord. Uh, that's why the Vikings liked it, because it never froze, and so they could be based in Oslo, and then they spread out for their raids in Europe down the uh, Oslo Fjord. So anyway, you can take ferry trips to popular recreational islands. There's hiking, there's walking, there's kayaking, there's bathing, and you can just cruise the fjords. There's a lot of shops and restaurants and, and clubs along Carl Johan's Gata, the main thoroughfare in the center of, of Oslo life, nightlife. There are, you know, vintage boutiques and hipster fashions, and you can take advantage of reindeer and elk and salmon and all those kind of foods there. Um, we'll be visiting the new opera house. I don't know if it, I know it came up in one of those videos, and it's like a glacier, so you can actually walk on the roof of the opera house to visit it. There's the Akershus Fortress, which is a medieval castle right right in the uh, dock area. It's right where, where the cruise ships dock. And they have changing of the guards there. Uh, it's been there for, you know, hundreds of years. We'll be able to visit the Royal Palace in the summertime. Uh, they have the changing of guard. There's the Oslo Cathedral. Um, in terms of peace studies, it's the home of the Nobel Peace Prize. So I plan to have us visit the Nobel Peace Center, the Nobel Institute, Perhaps maybe do a little research in the Nobel Library. I've been in touch with the Nobel Institutes for a number of years. The last time I was in Oslo, I, w I went as a reporter covering the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony, so I was able to have access to, to all of those various places. And so I plan to use that kind of, of access to get us into places like the Peace Center and the, and the Institute. Also, there's the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, one of the major... Um, peace centers in the world. It's very interesting. If you look them up, you'll find out who is rated probably to win the Nobel Peace Prize, which will be announced next week. There's a group of young 
activists. They're, they're sort of like the favorites. Not the, not the woman from Sweden, but another are very youth-oriented. There's also a group that's protecting journalists overseas. And so you can see, you know, the ones that the Norwegians think are probably going to win. So we're going to visit the Peace Research Institute. We can visit the Parliament Building. There are tours there on the weekend. Uh, also, I also have a background in English, and we'll probably talk a little bit about Henrik Ibsen, very famous uh, Norwegian playwright. His most famous work is something called Doll's House, which was a really early statement of looking at a lack of communication between men and women. And so we can go visit Henrik Ibsen's house, which is right next to the, the uh, royal palace. Henrik Ibsen was a somewhat short fellow, so he had high heels, and he poofed his hair up, and he wrote letters to national leaders around the world saying, if you like my plays, will you send me an award? You know, so like the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So every day he would walk to his favorite cafe at the Grand Hotel wearing all his you know, presidential and monarchical awards. Um, let's see. Katie will, will tell us about the, the National Gallery and we see Edvard Munch's The Scream. You all know that. Edvard Munch is, is Norway's most celebrated painter. Uh, so there are a lot of things we can do. I can talk a little bit about your know, peace studies. We'll be looking at things like the meaning. Change the slides for oh. your class. All right. So you can do that. There we go. So it, it's very, I'm very excited about teaching peace studies as it is the home of the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, we'll be studying the meanings of peace. We'll be studying the meanings of wars. You know, they don't just happen. And they don't have, wars don't have to continue to happen. They're a human activity that we decide to do or we stumble into doing it. And, and I think with, with enough insight, we can find ways not to stumble into it. I mean, people are going to, people are going to disagree with each other. You know, we're never going to be all peace and love all the time. But we can find a way not to go down that path of organized warfare. So we'll be looking at all these, these aspects of peace studies within the uh, confines of Norway. In addition to the Nobel Peace Prize, Oslo is also the home to a lot of uh, international negotiations. The International Landmine Treaty was negotiated in Oslo. Several of the Palestinian-Israeli agreements were, were studied in Oz, were developed in Oslo. And there's ongoing negotiations regarding the Nicaraguan fighting group. So we're going to have a lot of fun things visiting these various sites and in, in Oslo. We'll be visiting the, the Resistance uh, Museum. Because when Gandhi was trying to push the British out of India through non-cooperation, people said, well, he can never do that with the Nazis. The Nazis would come out with machine guns. But Germany invaded Norway in 1941, and so for four years they were under Nazi domination, but they simply refused to cooperate. And there were some, you know, secret activities at night, but they just dragged their feet. And so they're a very good example of people that just refuse to cooperate, which is what nonviolent protest is all about. You just refuse to cooperate. Because Gandhi told the British, there's no way 100,000 British officers are going to control 300 million Indians if the Indians don't want to cooperate. And ultimately, that's what peace is about, just finding other ways to settle our differences. Um, is there any questions about the, the peace studies class? Like I say, a lot of it will be, you know, we'll be going over this theory, and then we'll be going out into the into the area and visiting the sites. And I'm I'm going to Oslo again in January because I've been there, you know, a number of times. But this time I'm going to go to walk the streets exactly where I want to take the classes. You know, try to knock on the doors to get into those doors. And what would it take if we have a special lecture here? I also plan to visit the various clubs and restaurants to try to get some sense of, you know, how much does it cost? Are there any age uh, uh, limitations? And I'll try the various public transit to get around. And so, you know, I've been to, I've done study abroad in Florence, and we do that a lot, so we, we know where we're going. 
So I want to try to bring that knowledge to, to the summer experience by going there and trying a lot of this stuff out in January. Okay, I'll turn it over to Katie. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And so in a kind of very different course, we're going to also be offering an art history course, Art 100. Um, and this is actually different than any of the courses we are currently offering, which focus specifically on kind of a chronological development of a particular culture. Instead, Art History 100 is a fundamentals class. So we're going to be really focusing on how one approaches art in general. So looking at the way line and color are used to kind of create a certain experience. What different mediums like if you're looking at architecture versus uh, stone sculpture versus fabric, what is that different kind of medium and what is specific to that and understanding it. And then also because we will be in a city, um, thinking about ideas like public art versus stuff in a museum, galleries, right? So we're going to be approaching things in a much more kind of organic way rather than kind of a chronological, we have to learn this style, then that style, then that style. Um, and we're going to use what is in Oslo as our basis. So if I'm asking you to analyze a painting, you're going to go out into the city and find a painting to analyze, okay? So we're going to talk about how um, the space around an object affects the experience of it. Again, you're going to go out into the city to actually experience that instead of just sitting in a classroom. So that's going to be one of the big deals here. And for art history in general, and especially a fundamentals class like this, what it's really going to be giving you is the ability to look at all visual imagery in a new way. And this is something that I'm really passionate about with art history because I know that since you were little, you were all taught how to read, right? You were taught what it means to have, you know, this connotation of a word versus that one in a sentence. But you rarely think about how visual imagery has a language like that of the written. And so what art history does is it's going to really make you much more aware of the visual environment around you, to how you are being influenced by that news article that has a picture next to it that gives you a certain impression, right? And so often that's what we know, right? We look at the image, we look at the you know title of the newspaper article, and we never bother to read any further because oftentimes we're convinced by that image, right? Oh, that's true. And so what's so great about art history is it gives you the same kind of analytical tools that you have for you know, uh, looking at a written document and then applying it to that so that you don't kind of approach the world in the same way. And for me, this is really exciting because I've actually not gotten to teach abroad before. So this will be my first time where I actually get to take an art history class out into the city and explore rather than throwing things up on a slide, right? And so this is really exciting for me. I've done study abroad. I've done the other side. I've been the student who's done study abroad. I um, studied abroad and studied um, French. And so I did that at the Sorbonne um, through AIFS, actually, um, a while ago. And then I also lived in Paris for nine months. So I'm very used to kind of doing it from that other side. So it's going to be really fun to get to kind of take people around and get to um, enjoy it with you. Now, as to places we might get to go, um, they're actually opening up a new Edvard Munch Museum in 2020. It's supposed to open in spring. It's supposed to be like 10 stories tall, has seven floors worth of his work. So you will not just see the scream. You'll see everything else that everyone else. So when everyone's like, oh, I love this screen, you can be like, well, did you see which version? Right? There's more than one. Did you know that? No? Oh, well, there you go. Um, so we'll see um, this incredible museum that's brand new. We'll talk about it because it's really going to be interesting in that it's going to be at the forefront of architecture. One of the things I find fascinating about Oslo in particular, I haven't been there yet, but in my research, um, is that because it doesn't have quite as much of the ancient buildings surviving because the Vikings built in wood, um, a lot of the area is really modern. And so there's a lot of things that have been built in the last five years, 10 years, that are at the forefront of contemporary architecture. They have something called the um, barcodes or something like that, where it's um, this whole section of new buildings that are really modern. The new opera house, again, it's, you know, these are international known architects that are um, working on the public buildings in Oslo. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun kind of seeing that. Plus, there seems to be a huge contemporary art scene. There's lots of galleries and things like that that we can go and look at as well. So it'll be really interesting. We unfortunately will not 
not get to go to the National Gallery because I don't believe it will be open yet. They are uh, currently building a brand new museum, so we're they're unclear on the dates when that will open. But there's so much other stuff. There's a lot of public sculpture in Oslo. Um, there's lots of different ones. I just found Ibsen. There's a 20 giant sculptures um, related to one of his plays that um, are is in Oslo as well. So there's some really fun things that we can look at. And even when we go to something like the Nobel Peace you know, area, we're gonna look at the architecture too. How do they display it? How do they kind of convey meaning through the visual aspects of that experience as well? Parliament, all of these things, what you'll realize is that you experience things differently because of the built environment that you're in. And that conveys ideas of power that are used to reinforce certain you know, ideological positions and things like that. So we'll get to talk about all of those different things. So I think it's gonna be fascinating and fun. It's also not a course that we've been offering at Citrus in a while, so you should be able to take it without any concern. It's IGETSI and um, CSU approved, so it should fit into everyone's, and it's also an elective for the um, art history major. So if you're doing that, it just fits all of those. Any questions on art history? Yeah. Okay. So we're just going to go back and give you the schedule. So the program uh, will start with departure on June 26th. Will there be class here on campus before they go, John? Not. Yeah. There might be a few sessions on campus. We have a few sessions on campus prior to departure. Is that your plan? Sometimes we like to do that to get some of the necessary information yes. out so that we can spend more time in the city right. rather than that. But if we offer it, it would be taped like we're doing today. And that way, um, if you couldn't make it that particular day, you could still do the work before getting to Oslo. Yes. Great. Uh, arrival on Saturday the 27th. Um, remember all flights to Europe are overnight and then you'll begin with your orientation and your half-day tour of Oslo on the 28th. Uh, classes will begin on the 29th and your return to the U.S. would be on July 25th. So I'm going to skip through there. Some of your cultural activities, your walking tour of Oslo, your guided tour of the Opera House and of the City Hall. You'll visit the, and forgive me on the pronunciation of the peninsula, Big Doi, Big Doi, uh, peninsula, including your round trip ferry, your Viking Museum, which is so cool. Uh, Norwegian Museum of Cultural History is located there as well. That will be some of your cultural activities. These are some of your cultural activities. You'll have more in involved with your class. This is the view of the Royal Palace, I think, from yes, in the yes. far. This is Carl Johan Gata, which is the, the big street. I'm saying Gata, they, it's gate from our standpoint, right. which you say gate, they won't know what you're talking about. They'll say Carl Johan's Gata. <laughs> yeah. okay. This is the Opera House, is That's that right? Opera right? House. Yeah. Look at how cool it is. This is in the, the big doy, the, right? This is actually the Viking um, church. So we'll actually get to see a real Viking church, one of the wood ones that survived. Um, they actually moved it here along with other buildings from um, around uh, the Oslo area. So it's an outdoor museum. So we'll definitely be going there. Excellent. The Viking muse ship museum? Yes. In yes. the big doy? These are some funeral ships. That's why they still exist, because they were buried and then... They right. dug them up, and, and I think they have three of them there. Excellent. Accommodations in multi-bedded. So your accommodations are included in the program fee. In um, with you'll have, it'll be hostel accommodations. So they'll be multi-bedded ensuite rooms. So they'll have each have their own bathrooms. Uh, included daily breakfast and access to a shared kitchen, which is nice. So you can do some group meals. You know, all participate in the grocery shopping and the meal preparation, and that helps cut down on costs for meals. Um, bed linens and towels are provided. That's nice. You don't have to carry that all with you. Wi-Fi provided in laundry facilities there on site. So that makes it a lot easier. That's the Grand Hotel there. That's their big hotel. And those four people standing on the balcony are the Nobel laureates of that year. They were from Tunisia, and they helped to negotiate a new peace treaty away from more regressive Islamic um, type things. And so, but they're, they're civic organizations. 
and there's a in December there's a major torchlight parade going down the down Carl Johann Gotha, and then what we see these lights here. But that's that's on the night that the Nobel Prize is going to be announced. Um, so your program fee, based on a group of 25 students, is 3,474. It will include your accommodations, as described. Uh, the orientation program, so as soon as you get to uh, Oslo, our program staff will meet you and um, have a thorough orientation on all of the program components, what to do, what not to do, um, give you an information packet. Uh, the activities, uh, additional activities for orientation might be a travel workshop or a cultural workshop, right, about Norway and its culture as well. Guided tour of Oslo would be included. The excursion to Big Doy Peninsula. Um, guided tours of parts of Oslo, class-related activities, including visits to museums, monuments, whatever your faculty would like to include as part of your class curriculum. And we'll coordinate it. We'll, take, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll all go out together Absolutely. and do various activities, a combination of art activities as well as cultural activities and peace-related government activities. So we'll all be going out together. We'll be doing a lot of walking because it's a very pedestrian-friendly place. Awesome. Your Fitbits will explode. It's going to be about 65 to 75 out, so it'll be really nice weather. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Very pleasant. Um, your AIFS student center and staff services, including a 24-7 emergency contact. So, like I said, if you know anything happens outside of regular office hours, you'll always have someone you can call. Medical insurance is included. Fee refund would be if you were unable to participate in the program due to a medical emergency. Um, application fee would be included. And pre-departure services and orientation. So, about a month prior to departure, we'll meet here and we'll get you ready for the trip. What to pack, what not to pack, all that... You you know how to communicate money issues all those questions that you know you have when you travel outside the country we'll be able to help you with those issues then just to know things not included in the program fee would be your airfare although we do have an optional group flight that we don't have priced yet because it's really early um, but we will before you opt into that we can give you the prices uh, students can purchase their own flights if they'd rather do that uh, community college tuition fees so upon registration in one or both classes you would uh, pay your registration fees to Citrus as usual. If you get the promise grants or uh, what we call the BOG fee waiver, that can be applied. Textbooks would not be included. They would be upon um, notice from your faculty. Personal expenses including your passport fee and uh, any personal travel you wanted to do on any free time, that would not be included. And technically meals, although we will have a welcome meal and a farewell meal, um, meals would not be included. So the, um, I don't have a lot of information yet because it's so early on the round trip air package, but note that it's a round trip from LA to Oslo and would include airport pickup in Oslo and then, uh, and transport to the accommodation and then at the end of the program would be airport transfer on the return. Okay, so um, I don't know, I can't even estimate how much the, the fee will be. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if we have contracts with Norwegian Air, so I don't know. If not, um, Norwegian Air does fly LA to Oslo direct, so you can look into that. A lot of places direct yeah. and really nice. It's a yeah. one, um, cost airline, so it really yeah. connects um, Oslo to all over Europe. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to take a weekend trip somewhere else, the prices when I was looking at places like going to Prague and things like that were like 100 Nice. So it's really not that expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's another great option. Cool. Um, we will also do this, what we call Norway in a nutshell. I don't know who they named that tour, but it's hilarious. Uh, Norway in a nutshell tour, which will be a three day, two night excursion to Bergen. And it will, um, it's really well described in your brochure, but uh, you'll get. Uh, Train tickets on the railways, the cruise on the fjord, 
Uh, you'll it will also two nights in a hostel in Bergen and then return to Oslo by train. So that is a six hundred ninety five dollar addition if you want to take that tour. And we'd need a minimum of eighteen students to run this trip. So we'll see how that goes. Probably Norway in a nutshell because you get to see what the country really looks like. Yeah. Going up over the hills, seeing the forest, you'll see glaciers there, you'll see waterfalls there. And so yeah. it's a good, and you get to see what the water is like. Yeah. And so it's a good uh, experience of Norway outside of Oslo. Right. Yeah, and that's, I mean, uh, you know, we always have that you know, expectation that we're going to travel Europe and see so much of Europe. But when you go and study in a country, it's a really important also that you see all of the country, yeah. right? And not just Oslo, but you're able to see a lot of it. And here's some photos of it, too. Things you'll see, right? And these are your your yeah, friends' friends' photos, yeah. yeah. They're amazing. Um, so if you're into hiking, it's, some of the most, it's become one of the most important like hiking destinations. So, um, it's also got an amazing amount of waterfalls, from what yeah. I understand. The water mm. is incredible. All right, so generally, and, and the glaciers are still there, as yeah. opposed to lower latitudes, yeah. some of our glaciers are disappearing. Yeah, the glaciers are still intact. Yeah. yeah. John, I'll let you do this part. Um, it's very simple. You need to be 18 years old by the time the program begins, and you need to have. Uh, 12 units with a 2.5 GPA. If it's your first semester, we accept progress reports. If you had a significant life event or any issues and you're now improving your GPA, we'll give you a progress report and you'll be admitted to the program. You'll likely be admitted to the program. So to apply, it's very simple. Have you, have you visited the study abroad page already? Um, I can show you that here. Okay, now it's working. <laughs> oh, it's, this, it's a different computer this yeah. time. Um, so you can just Google Citrus Study Abroad. So just fill out the interest form. Um, there's a lot of useful information on the Study Abroad page, actually. Well, we'll talk about that later. But uh, the interest form will just take you to the smart sheets and you just complete it. You don't need to put too much information here. Um, just a few sentences is fine. So once you fill that out, we'll send you a link to AIFS. Citrus doesn't collect any fees. This is all through the AIFS portal. Um, you need to place your deposit by the deposit deadline. And those are all listed here on this sheet. Um, you have all the fees and, and options. And you see the deposit is due March 19th. And then the complete balance is due May 1st. So we're so far ahead here. This is great. I think awesome. if you're interested, in this yeah, state, so. yeah, you could really just have like a monthly goal and, and get here, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll talk about that more in a second. So once you place the deposit, you're in the program. Your spot is reserved. Um, for financial aid, there is the uh, Pell Grant that's available in the summer. However, you have to be enrolled in at least six units to receive half of the Pell Grant. And it might, I think last time, because they did this for Japan, and they received the Pell Grant like the last week when they're in Japan. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind as well. You might have to just kind of reimburse yourself if you're receiving the, the Pell Grant. Mm -hmm. um, and of course you can save your uh, financial aid if you have access to that this semester or next semester. Scholarships. Um, I think everything is also listed here. If you go back to the study abroad page we have our scholarship information. Did I get it all up there? Yeah, okay. So we just had a fundraising scholarship meeting. You can watch that. Um, the really big scholarships that are available are the Gilman Scholarship and the Fund for Education Abroad Scholarship, the FEA. So the Gilman just closed, but it'll be open again for the summer. Right, so the Gilman offers two chances to for summer study abroad. The 
like uh, first cycle just closed on October 1, this Tuesday. But you can still apply for the second cycle for a summer study abroad program. So don't let anybody tell you it's it's closed. It will open again. So yeah. if you're a Pell Grant eligible student, you definitely want to apply for the Gilman. All right. It can be up to $2,500 to in scholarships for this program. They prioritize uh, community college students. They prioritize uh, first generation college students. So if your parents didn't get a college education, you're considered a first gen, right? So they're all points in your favor. You definitely want to apply for this scholarship. It'll open early January and mm -hmm. close the first Tuesday in March. Mm -hmm. But we have students wait until the first Sunday in March to apply for this scholarship. It's crazy. Get a jump on it and start researching the scholarship, all of the scholarships, writing a really good competitive essay, yeah. which we have wonderful resources up yeah, there you for you guys. Click the scholarship yeah. essay writing tutorial. You have this it's like, from... It's like step-by-step -step how to write a really yeah. good essay. Follow it. Yeah, and come talk to me. Um, some students really need to work on their essays because... It takes time. You can't start at Tuesday at 6 p.m. or sorry, Sunday at 6 p.m. And, and expect to hand it in on Tuesday. That's impossible. Yeah, yeah, and you can't just throw things there. It has to be formatted in a way that's coherent. A theme. You have to, yeah, you have to have a really good argument, right? Aren't you guys in English 103? <laughs> so you have time. That's the good news. You can do you this. Have plenty of time. Um, plenty of time. And if you're taking an English class, you could ask your professor, exactly. is it okay that I drop by your office hour, or will you look at this? And most of the time, they're very happy to do that, so you can get feedback. The and there's also a writing center on campus November where you can get okay. feedback as well. So, so ask your writing professors or ask the, the, the writing center as well. Also, there's the Fund for Education Abroad. That is an important one, too. That's like the second most important one. This is open to anybody, so it's not a merit-based, it's not a need-based scholarship, sorry. It's more of a merit-based scholarship. Look, it opens on November 11th for Summer Study Abroad, so this is coming up. You write your essay now for this one. You can recycle it for Gilman, right? You can recycle it for nearly anything. So, yeah, you got to get started on it now. It can't wait till Christmas break. And I can't wait till you know midterms and final time because it everything accumulates. So you got to get on it. All of you should be applying for the FEA scholarship. Okay, use the scholarship essay writing guide and take it to your faculty as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. It's up to twelve hundred dollars, one thousand two hundred fifty dollars. We'll also have the Citrus College Spring uh, Foundation scholarships which I believe everybody who applied to that last time was awarded. Um, because people don't apply for scholarships, they just think they're not going to get them. Um, and then you won't get them. So, you know, go for it. What's that? It was like 500 different scholarships. And you apply once, and it's really simple to apply. And then you're awarded based on how much money they have. Yeah, you could get more than one. You can do the citrus and the other, and certainly sure. yeah. Else. Yeah, my student worker got one last sure. spring. Um, we have students so. win them all the time. If they really write a really good essay, that's really half the battle. That CCIE world, did you say that one? Yeah, so there's a Donald R. Colin, Colton. 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 I, did I send you? I might have emailed you all that. That uh, I did an email to you. Yes. Okay, good. So I, I sent, yeah, because you can't find it on this web page. Right. I couldn't find it. So I emailed her, Rosalind, about it, and she right. sent it to me. But if you go to this link, there's more scholarships available there, as well as these links That one here. has a crazy amount of scholarships up there. They're not just study abroad. They're all kinds of different scholarships that you, because you can apply to any scholarship, really. Um, apply to everything you possibly can. Yeah. Okay? I mean, you're so far ahead. I'm so glad you guys are here already. Yeah. Um, you know, we're always yeah talking about deadline these, pass, these deadline are, pass, right? Yeah, they're always the way in right. the future. So, right. or they the deadlines sooner than right. students are ready for all. So, do you want to do this? Sure. So we have had students either miss deadlines or tell us, "I don't like to write essays. I'm not going to do it." Um, so they basically fund their study abroad using creative ways. We have students do a combination of all of it apply for scholarships and do some creative funding and save up financial aid 
Um, and this, these are options that we wanted to share with you that students have found to be successful. Number one, what they told us, and we had three students in our civil meeting about an hour ago say, I lived like a monk, or I stopped doing all of fun stuff in the months up to my study abroad. Um, I mean, you're like nine months out of Oslo, so I'm not saying you have to live for, like a monk for the next nine months, but there are little things that you can do to you know, cut down on your expenses that will help you bank some money for when you're studying abroad. Um, cut down on your Starbucks is a big one, right? Starting to make your own coffee, that helps a lot. Maybe on the amount that you eat out. I have two boys that one is here, his second year, and the other one just transferred. And I swear that they will go out to eat, even with my refrigerator full of food. It's leftovers, I ate that yesterday. They will go out to Chick-fil-A. It's no, there's nothing in there. You mean, what do you mean? I have to make my own lunch? They'll go out and get a burrito, right? So if you start to make your own food at home and bring it with you, I bet you could spend a lot less. Um, and then back to basics ideas like getting extra hours on, um, extra hours at work, or we have students doing garage sales, so they're going around and asking their family or their neighbors for donations of stuff that they don't want anymore and organizing big garage sales. We had students do that. Um, car washes, we had a student tell us a few weeks ago how she organized a car wash on Saturday morning, donation-based only, and made like $300, I think she told mm -hmm. us she made. Um, Spaghetti dinners, we had students go and organize a big spaghetti dinner and invite all his family and friends, but charge admission, <laughs> right? And uh, donation-based, and he made a couple hundred dollars that way. There's the crowdfunding, the GoFundMe, the Venmo, ask for gifts of money rather yeah. than gifts of stuff, right? Cut down on your Prime, all those subscriptions, streaming services that you have, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Your Disney Pass, that's a big one. I'd rather take a cruise on a fjord in Norway than take do It's a Small World in Disney. Do you have a Disney here. Pass? I'm curious. See, okay, there's always a few. So, oh, you do too. All right. So, so it is a lot of students. I was, I was like, I, really? Cassie <laughs> at Mount Sachs says students will cry if when she tells them to give up their Disney Pass for one year. Disney will be the same in 2021. I swear. It'll be better. Right? Just go get Star Wars first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, saw, I mean, those are ideas, right? So. And our students, we just had our Seville meeting, and one of the students just talked about, yeah, what you're saying, Maybe suffering, sure. delayed gratification, right? And uh, she picked up extra shifts. Picked up extra shifts. Worked a lot, didn't go out. And that's how she was able to do Sevilla with, right. I think, she probably right. used financial aid, right, too. Right, right. Um, all right, so that's basically our, our presentation. If you'd like to get in touch with me, I think you know how to do it. You have your faculty there. I believe I put you on the timeline, too. Um, so we have our AFS contacts here as well. Um, oh, I didn't put you guys on there, did I? No. Well, anyway. Um, any final statements from anybody here about Oslo? I would just say if you don't already have a passport, it's another one of those yes. things. Oh, passport. Um, yeah, right start thinking about now. Um, it can you get, have that anyway. You know, it's a couple of months sometimes if you don't, ex you know, expedite it. So it's worth just getting on that yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can yeah. go. Next I heard the. Do this double the price. The so Glendora. Save that money and start um, early. There's a form online that you can actually print out if you mm -hmm. already have a passport. If you don't, then they have specific things. There's actually passport places where you can go and deal. You can go to the Glendora post office. That's what everybody suggests. Because I guess. Oh, okay. Can you do that for the for if you never had a passport? Yeah. Okay, I think that's you can. Right. As a full experience, you know, it's we're going to take a class. No, it's the whole experience. You're gonna you're gonna be visiting Norway. We're going to be visiting school related sites. You're going to be going off in the fjord on the weekends, mm -hmm. or going to the beach, or riding mm -hmm. bicycles, or hiking. And so you're going to be immersed in this experience for four weeks. It will be like living in another country. You are living in another country. <laughs> You'll be eating yeah. stuff that you didn't even know existed. <laughs> so there's all sorts of different new experiences yeah. that you'll come across. Different snacks. No no flaming Cheetos, but they'll have something else. They have something like a Kit Kat. Butter, I'll just warn you. Their favorite you're candy bar is something, have something have like a Kit butter. Kat. Okay. There you go. They have salmon. They have elk. They have elk. reindeer. Ooh. 
Yeah, so okay. all those kind of Nordic treats. That, and they also have this very big Nordic hot treats. dog that looks like it's in a tortilla or something. Uh -huh. That's a favorite. Yeah, of yeah there's the bread food. tortilla that's made of potatoes and milk and cream. Yeah. Is it Norway that has the fermented fish? Yes, they do. It, okay, yeah. it smells really bad, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> what is it called? Tristerninger. Oh, okay, it's infamous. I think I've heard of that. You have to try it if you go. Let me know, because I'm not trying it. Pickled, um, pickled, pickled things. Okay, if I go, I'll try it. Um, I, do you guys have any questions at all about the program? Yes. So I actually have a question. Um, about, I'm actually through Citrus, through the VA, mm -hmm. and we're on a time basis, meaning mm -hmm. like if I'm not in school, my time mm -hmm. is still being burned because I have a fixed date of when I have to have my classes done, right. and then it's out of pocket for me after that. Sure. How does this affect that? Like, is this considered an off-time basis, so they're not going to be burning through my time and credit, or is this am I uh, going to lose my VA benefits? Well, you'd still be enrolled as a student in, uh -huh. at, in Citrus College, so you should still be able to receive benefits when you're there. Okay. So you can receive your your housing balance and tuition. So everything through the VA is going to be the same. I believe so. And talk to David Rodriguez. Yeah, that's what I go to. Talk to him, and he'll tell you the details. Okay. Okay. He's familiar with the program. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you, faculty. Great job. Thank you, Paula, and thank you, students, for coming. Yes. Thank you, everyone that's here. Thank you.